You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. Welcome back to the Parsha Power Special Pesach Edition. My name is Rabbi Ari Wolby, and this is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. I've been planning, like I do typically every year, look through the Haggadah, look through some of the ideas, some of the themes. I found some interesting ideas that I would love to share here with our podcast audience. You know, typically I would look for nice divrei Torah, nice thoughts and ideas on the Haggadah, things I can share with my family. But this year, I something else stood out, and it really is remarkable that if we look carefully at the Haggadah, every important Jewish theme is in the Haggadah. And we'll go through a few of them, and hopefully it'll be a source of inspiration, an eye-opener for, for you as it was for me. So the first thing is, one of the things we say in the Manashtana is that on the night of Pesach we only eat matzah, while on the rest of the year we also eat chametz. Uh, chametz is something which is leavened, something which has, you know, like a, a yeast in it that grows. Uh, but really, if you think about it, chametz and, and matzah are exactly the same. Bread and matzah are the same thing. It's just the only difference between them is time. And I think that that is one of the most important elements of Judaism is not to waste time, is to take everything that we have coming our way as an opportunity to accomplish, to achieve, to get things done. And then when we search for the chametz, uh, which this year will be on Thursday night, but the night before Pesach typically, we search inside ourselves. We look in the nooks and crannies of our homes, but we also search within ourselves, in our cracks and crevices, in our own neshama, in our own soul, and see maybe there's areas that we can enhance our character. Perhaps there are areas that we can perfect our traits and look at our relationships, what needs improvement, where we need to make amends, etc. And to really utilize this time to connect with ourselves and understand our mission and purpose in this world. Speaking of searching for chametz, Many of the Hasidic masters would spend many, many hours searching the chametz, not only the chametz of their homes, checking in the corners, checking all around in the, in the drawers and in clothes, but also checking in themselves and really spending a tremendous amount of time investigating in themselves what areas need improvement. So I think it could be a great example for ourselves to look into ourselves, to look into our own lives every single day, activities that we do, in what way can we enhance them and make them better. Okay, so now when we look at the Haggadah, we begin essentially the Magid part with Halach Ma'anya. Halach Ma'anya is really talking about the bread of the poor, but also inviting in the poor people to join us in our meal. And it is one of the greatest fundamental principles in Judaism, our responsibility for others, not to live for ourselves, but to live for the people around us as well. Uh, That's the essence of marriage. That's the essence of parenting, to care for others. But that's also the essence of community, is that we don't only begin eating and think of ourselves. We think of those around us, who else is needy, who else needs a place to eat. So we begin the meal with the first note of Jewish values, is taking care of others. Halach ma'anya a poor person, someone who's needy. Let's bring him, let's have him sit and join us around our table. Additionally, you know, the halacha teaches us that one is not allowed to eat before they feed their animals. Imagine, our animals, a dog, you have a little puppy, you have a cat, or you have any type of animal, you have, you have to feed them before you sit down and eat. That's even more so if we're dealing with another human being. Of course, we need to make sure that every human being that's in need has a place to eat. But then we go on to the Manashtana, and we ask the four, four questions, and we have our children ask the four questions, and the halacha tells us that even if we're sitting and, and having the Seder all alone, we should still ask the four questions. That's because asking questions is a very, very fundamental principle in Judaism. Asking questions. In other religions, they frown at questions. They 
don't like questions because that means you're not accepting their premise of their religion or their principles of their faith. In Judaism, the essence of Judaism is asking questions. We're not allowed to ask questions. We're obligated to ask questions. We know that the Mishnah tells us, Lo lamed, that if someone is shy, if someone is embarrassed to ask questions, they'll never learn. And that's another fundamental principle in Judaism. And then we try to answer the questions by saying, We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, which really doesn't answer the question of the four preceding questions. What this is telling us is that we are always slaves. Every single one of us, every person alive or whoever was alive ever before is always a slave. The question is, to what are we enslaved? And that is the priority that a Jew needs to make. Am I enslaved to my gadgets, to my technology, to my career, to what is it that I'm enslaved to? Or am I enslaved to the Almighty? These are really important questions that a person needs to ask themselves. We are here to be slaves, but slaves to the Almighty, to emulate Hashem and not to be enslaved to other things. Then, right after we talk about Avadim Ayinu, we go into Masebe Rabbi Elazar, a story told about Rabbi Elazar that all of the sages were sitting in Bnei Brak, and it tells us how they were observing the Pesach Seder. I'm sure there are thousands of other sages that we can choose, but specifically, it's teaching us the idea that we need to have someone we learn from, a Rebbe, a teacher, someone who we can seek counsel from. The Mishnah tells us, Asela Chorav, to have a teacher. In every area of life, we need to make sure we have a teacher, someone who's a guide, a mentor, that we can ask and seek counsel from. And this is, I think, the next important message that the Haggadah is teaching us. Then we go into the four sons. Interestingly, if you look at the four sons, what precedes the four sons? The wise, the wicked, he who doesn't know how to answer, the innocent or the tame son. And what it says right before it is, Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu, Baruch Shunasan Torah, Baruch Hu. And those four phrases, and what our sages teach us is that it says Baruch, it says blessed four times to tell us that every single one of God's children is blessed. They don't have to think like us. They don't have to live like us. They don't have to act like us. But every one of God's children, God sees potential. God sees opportunity in them. And we should find that potential and opportunity in every person that's around us. Hashem loves each and every Jew. Hashem loves each and every one of us. And we all have the obligation to see that virtue in other people as well, even if their stripes are different than ours. Go a little bit further in the Haggadah, and we talk about Vihi Sha'amda. Our sages tell us Vihi is the same word as Ayeh. Ayeh means, where is God? Crying out to God. And this is a tale of the Jewish people, where the Jewish people for forever have been crying out to the Almighty. And the Almighty is always there. We have to know that every generation, they're always out to destroy us. That doesn't only mean the nations around us, but we all face our own personal struggles. And what we need to know is that God is always there to hear our pleas, our prayers, our requests, our cries, our tears. And that is our most powerful tool. The most powerful tool, the hish amda, the ve'ayesh amda, the prayer, the, the seeking God, wherever we are, any challenge that we face, we should never, ever think that all hope is lost. God always wants our prayers. God always hears our prayers. Sometimes the answer is not exactly the way we want it, but that's because we don't see a full picture, and the Almighty does. And then we see the plagues, the plagues that the Egyptians got, the 10 plagues. Some say it was 50 plagues. Some say it was 200 plagues. Some, some say it was 250 plagues. And we go through those opinions in the Haggadah. But what's the idea behind it? Why did they get these plagues? If you look at each one of the plagues in detail, you'll see that they reciprocate as a specific punishment for how the Egyptians made the Jews suffer, how they afflicted the Jews. And this is the concept of reward and punishment. Every single person has free will, and with that free will, we can do things that are positive, we can do things that are negative. And there's reward that comes for those that are positive, and there's punishment that comes for those that are negative. And that's our choice. We're jumping a little further in the Haggadah, and we see the song Dayenu that everyone loves to sing. 
We say, If God had only brought us to Mount Sinai and not given us the Torah, that would be enough. That would be sufficient. Is that indeed so? Why would we want to go to Mount Sinai and not receive the Torah? What would be good about that? There would be nothing good about it. Our sages tell us a very, very important idea. We did not go to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. That's a mistake. That's not why we went to Mount Sinai. The reason we went to Mount Sinai was for God's revelation to the Jewish people. You see, Judaism is not a religion. Judaism is a relationship. And everything that follows after the Jewish people heard from God himself directly say, at Mount Sinai, Anochi Hashem Lekacha, I am Hashem your God. Everything that followed after that was memorabilia, souvenirs, to remind us of that same revelation. We merited in Judaism, we merited in the Torah as a gift with 613 not commandments, but rather souvenirs, that each souvenir, each mitzvah is able to bring back that same clarity, that same revelation that the Jews experienced at Mount Sinai. So the next time we see a mezuzah, the mezuzah is not just a specific mitzvah telling us to put on every doorpost in our home a parchment of paper, which says a verse from the Torah. That's not what it is. What it is is an opportunity for us to recall the beautiful relationship we have with the Almighty. That's what a mitzvah is, a mitzvah. So now, had the Jews only gone to Mount Sinai but not received the Torah, it makes a lot of sense that the Jews were only going to Mount Sinai for one reason, and that was to establish the relationship with the Almighty. The side benefit was that we also received the Torah, a Torah that we can learn, a Torah that we can follow, and a Torah that we can connect to the Almighty with every single day of our lives. And that's why we're saying thanks. We're saying thanks that God went beyond just the relationship. He said, here, I'm not only going to get engaged to you, but I'm also going to give you a ring so that you can remember this relationship and how special it is. We also see in the Haggadah about history, a lot of history, a lot of the details of what happened and where we were. And what's the point? I mean, you don't see many holidays where we have to read all this lengthy paragraphs of our history and where we were and where we went and how it split and where it split and all the details. Because history counts. History matters. We are our history. And it's important for us to know that it's not just Memorial Day. It's not just, oh, something once happened and we're just commemorating it. No, it's happening today as well. It's a history that repeats itself every single year again and again. What we're trying to do is reestablish that relationship back to where it was, to bring everything back to, you know, we have a very, very busy year. We're all busy with our lives, and we need to, once in a while, just hit the refresh button and start all over again. If we skip a little further in the Haggadah, we say the Hallel. And the Hallel is singing Hashem's praise. We're singing God's praise. The idea is that we need to feel connected. When you say thank you, when you show appreciation and gratitude, it's the best way not to live in habit. It's the best way not to live with rote, with just taking things for granted. So we try to emphasize and thank the Almighty for every single one of his goodness and kindness that he does for us, the kindness that he bestows upon us. I just want to leave off with one amazing story. You know, Reb Levi Yitzchak of Barditchev was known as a lover of every single Jew. The story is told that during the time of his life, Turkey and Russia had a very hostile relationship and all uh, Turkish merchandise were contraband in Russia. So one Seder night, Reb Levi Yitzchak told his students, he says, please bring me some Turkish snuff. And the students replied and said that uh, it is forbidden and it's not available, and nobody has Turkish snuff. And the Rebbe insisted, and he says, I will not begin the Seder without it. I need the Turkish snuff. So they continued to persuade Rebbe Levi Yitzchak that it's not possible. He said, I want you to go and knock on doors and find it. Sure enough, they went around the neighborhood, and they found someone who had Turkish snuff hidden, and they said it's for the Rebbe, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak, and they brought it to Rebbe Levi Yitzchak. He was very happy that he had the snuff. And then he says to uh, the students, he says, I can't begin the Seder till you bring me some Turkish wool. 
And they said again, nobody has Turkish wool. It's contraband. You're not allowed to have it. It's a penalty of death if you were to be found with it. And of course, they went around and they found some Turkish wool. Then the Rebbe said, we cannot begin the Seder till you go out and bring me some chametz. Go to one of the Jewish homes and find me some chametz. And they knocked door to door, searched all the homes. They could not find any chametz. And Rebbe Levi Yitzchak joyfully lifted his eyes towards heaven and proclaimed, Master of the universe, the Tsar has a mighty army to enforce his laws under pain of death. Yet, despite his prohibition of any goods from Turkey, there's plenty of Turkish snuff and Turkish wool to be had there. You, on the other hand, have not enlisted an army to enforce your prohibitions, yet no Jew in this town possesses even a morsel of prohibited chametz. Are your people not faithful to you and worthy of redemption? I think it's such an amazing perspective. You know, the most celebrated Jewish holiday around the globe is Pesach. I want to share with you one more story, actually. I'm just reminded of another story. I want to share this before we end. My mother-in-law, may she live and be well, had a study partner through Partners in Torah. Those of you who don't know, Partners in Torah is a great organization. Any one of you listeners anywhere out in the world, if you want a study partner, you can call up 1-800-STUDY-42, and this incredible organization, Partners in Torah, will set you up with a study partner, someone who will learn with you the topic that you're interested in learning. It's all free. It's over the phone. You can do it over Skype or any other vehicle of communication. And my mother-in-law's study partner, they were learning for many months, but it came the, right before Pesach. And his, as in most Jewish homes, it gets a little hectic at times before Pesach with all the cleaning and all the cooking and all the everything that's necessary to prepare for Yom Tov for the holiday. So my mother-in-law gave a disclaimer to her study partner that they won't be learning next week because it is going to be Pesach. She says, Pesach, what's that? Passover. My mother-in-law goes on to give her a short explanation to the laws, a very basic outline of the laws of Pesach. We don't eat bread, etc., etc. So the study partner, not very familiar with Pesach, said, no problem. We'll continue after Pesach. We'll continue our learning. Right after Pesach, when they resumed their learning, the study partner called my mother-in-law and says, you will not believe it. You're going to be so proud of me. She says, you know, it was during the holiday of Pesach, and like you told me, we shouldn't eat bread. So I picked up my children from school, and we stopped off at McDonald's. And I'll tell you, she said, I scratched off every last piece of bread from their cheeseburger. And I, I can tell you one thing, that although this lady didn't know much, she didn't know about the prohibition of eating cheeseburger, she didn't know perhaps the four cups of wine and matzah, but I guarantee you that God in heaven smiled at his beautiful children trying to do everything they can to observe the laws of Pesach. So many laws over the holiday of Passover to observe, but the one that everyone knows and everyone tries to observe to the best of their ability is not to have chametz, not to eat any bread during these eight days of Pesach. So my dear friends, have a lovely Pesach. Have an incredibly inspiring Seder. Share it with your friends, share it with your neighbors, share it with your family, and hopefully this will be the Pesach that leads us to a re complete redemption, a complete reunification with the Almighty, where the whole world will know that Hashem is King of the universe. My dear friends, have a lovely Pesach, and Chag Sameach. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcasts.com.